Hey everyone, welcome back. Today we're just going to do a quick recap on Palantir. So I put a video out back in December looking at their S1, which was this document which could be found on the SEC website. But back in uh, late February, they released their first 10K for the year. Um, so went ahead and read through most of this today and then threw together kind of an updated model for you guys. Um, interesting. Uh, I'm not sure if it really changes too much about the company, but um, I've, you know, tried to consolidate this video a little bit, kind of put a lot of the work up front already done. So you can just kind of look at the model and then download it if you would like in the um, description below. So first thing I did pull in the balance sheet, pretty, or sorry, income statement, pretty high level here, revenue, right? Um, impressive growth, you know, it's almost doubled in uh, two years. COGS, um, you know, they have really good gross margins. And then, you know, their expenses are just completely completely and totally out of control. Uh, but looking further into it, stock-based comp is a big piece of their expenses. Um, so we'll kind of go through that and then pull together some customer stuff. So they give you the average revenue by customer in their 10K um, for these two years and then their S1 had for 2018. Then average revenue by their top 20 customers. So we can see, right, their average revenue has actually been going up by customer, which I think is a good thing. It's they're upselling, you know, they're pushing more services on them. These companies are relying on them more. You know, you start a little entry level contract, you realize the Palantir service is great, whatever. So you kind of continue. And then we could back into their, so they gave us the customers in 20, um, but based off the average customer and then their revenue per customer and their total um, revenue, you can back into how many customers they've had each year. So you can see kind of a slow growth there. So the first thing we needed to do really for this, um, and they also give us the revenue split between commercial and government, and then United versus abroad, but I couldn't find older data. It might've been in the S1. Um, I didn't dig too hard for it. So we've kind of, I've, you know, I've recorded it in here for the sake of recording it, but um, you could go dig through and try to see if you can find splits over other years. My guess is the commercial customer base is actually growing, it looks like. Um, so I think that's a good thing because I think you can charge a commercial client more than you can charge a government client. Um, and then just a couple quick notes, you know, they have two main software services, Gotham and Foundry. Gotham is the government focused data processing software they have and then Foundry is for commercial um, enterprise. And they have customers in 40 industries and 150 countries. But first what I did here is kind of projected out customer growth and we will go back and we can revisit these assumptions. These are conservative, I would say. So I just took, you know, 2020 customer growth and then had it decreasing um, a quarter percent per year to get you 189 million customers by 2030, which, you know, that's, or 189 customers, not 189 uh, million. Sorry, these are just whole numbers. They have 108, right now they have 139 customers. Um, so it is really low, but you got to remember their customer base is governments, right? So there's only a handful of large governments and agencies in the world. And then it's basically like Fortune 500 customers, I would say. I would say like a small enterprise probably um, can't afford these services, right? If the average price is $8 million a year for a customer, um, you're really looking at Fortune 500 companies for the most part. So I would say this could probably approach a number close to like six or 700 if you did fortune 500 a couple other private companies that are large and then governments around the world um that that really probably is their customer base unless if they offer some cheaper services for smaller scale customers but it doesn't really seem like that's the direction they're going um next we kind of forecast out the revenue per customer growth so they had a, just a tremendous growth here in 2020. I don't know if this was like, and you see average revenue for their top 20. Um, we saw a huge spike as well. I don't know if they just like signed a massive contract or something that's super lucrative that, that kind of really jumped this up. So I used the 2018 and 19 growth of 7.7 and then had a decrease half percent a year. So these are our first baseline assumptions. You get these revenue numbers. So they're going from about 1.1 billion to 2.5. And this is just kind of the first pass look. Um, copied over the balance sheet, easy enough. And then now here's our DCF. So you'll see that this is linked back up, right? So we're going from one, one to the, to the two, five we have there. The next thing to really look at is COGS. So what we've done here, actually, if you look at their COGS as a percent of sales, 28, 33, 32, but they do provide us a stock-based compensation that's layered into their COGS number. And if we back that out, you know, COGS is 145, 215, 212. Um, so it's actually 
pr really good margins on that that perspective. So 25, 29, and 20 percent. Um, so what I've done here is kind of taken obviously much less than this. I'm assuming this these numbers have to drop. They're not the huge stock based comp is the direct listing, right? Gave all the you know gave all the employees a big payday. Everyone cashes out. You know everyone's happy. Um, so I think we're going to actually probably approach something closer to this 25 percent. Because um, we're at 20% if we strip out all stock-based comp for 2020, but I think you're still going to have stock-based comp, so you'll still have some come in there. Um, so I've had this hit 25%. The next really interesting piece here, right, is if we go to the SGNA number, um, out of control, <laughs> but a lot of it is stock-based comp as well. So we did the same thing. So you can see SGNA excluding stock-based comp goes 102% all the way down to 53%. So it's improving significantly but obviously you know as the company grows and they're getting to ipo they're hiring a ton of people um but it scales over time right there's a con there's like efficiencies um economies of scale in this perspective your sgna is going to decrease so i've actually layered in the assumption we're going to go to 53 percent because we're not going to have this massive you know three quarters of a billion dollar stock based compensation package and we're going to have a decrease five percent a year until we get down to 20%, which is probably like a reasonable amount for a, a corporation to operate at. Um, and, you know, this might actually not be the best assumption because if we actually look at it, our SGNA costs are decreasing um, for a handful of years and then it starts to increase just because our revenue isn't growing fast enough. But we'll, we'll tweak some of the revenue assumptions and that might kind of fix some of that um, kind of weird seasonality aspect there. And then the last thing is the R&D. Um, so they give us R&D as well, and it's a similar story. You back out the stock comp, and kind of what I noticed actually is without stock comp, they stay pretty close to 200 million a year in R&D. Um, so I kind of just pegged them to stay close to 200 million R&D when you exclude the stock-based compensation. So we have all of that, right? You roll this through CapEx. CapEx is pretty immaterial here. R&D is really like their CapEx, but usually in software companies, you can't capitalize um, R&D um, or software programs. So CapEx is probably just pretty small, like pp and &E, like actual buildings and stuff, building improvements. Um, depreciation, you know, nothing crazy. Oh, and that's PowerPoint. Um, so nothing crazy there. But, you know, kind of based off these assumptions, and here we can update this real quick. Let's just put this to 30. Um, and then that just kind of doesn't really impact cash flow. So with these assumptions, you know, 10% cost of capital, which is probably on the low side, to be honest. 3% terminal growth, also probably on the low side. Um, but you get $8.6 billion valuation. Um, I think it's always interesting. Let's go over to Yahoo and let's see what they're trading at. I think probably much higher than that. Um, but I honestly, I haven't checked their stock in a while. Yep. So they're trading at a $43 billion valuation. So my thought here is if you want to get close to a $43 billion valuation, the big thing is we can have the customer base grow. So instead of, right, we're going to say, hey, they're actually going to acquire new customers every year. And we're going to approach, you know, something 280 clients. And then our revenue is actually as, as our clients move on to our system, um, you know, I mean, even just having the, the customer base grow there, right? You see our revenue went from 2.3 to 3.8. So now if we hop back to our DCF, $11 billion market cap, you know, better, still nowhere near. Um, Come back here, you know, maybe we're even more aggressive. We're going to give them credit for have them grow 1% a year. Let's see if we can get this up to like, right here. Let me just do this as like 10%. What I'm trying to do here is like, assuming we can get like every Fortune 500 company on here um, by 2030. So maybe it's 15% what we need. Yeah, so something like 15%, right? That's going to get you, basically, this is saying in 10 years' time, every every Fortune 500 company and large enterprise, for the most part, is going to use Palantir in some form or fashion, which is probably not likely at all, um, but is what it is. 
And then I honestly, I would say in a scenario like this, um, revenue per customer probably actually grows slower. Um, just because you have more customers on of different sizes, it's going to dilute your, your revenue base. But anyways, if we say they get all 500, um, you know, Fortune 500 companies and some government agencies on there, $20 billion. So you're, you're getting better. Um, and I guess if you believe this wasn't risky, right? If you gave this a 7% discount, you know, 38 billion, they're trading at, what was it? 40, 43 billion. So you're in the, you're in the park, but I mean, I think it's risky. So I would leave a 10% on here if I was looking at it. Um, I mean, that's crazy how, you know, and I mean, that's the, the fun thing about DCFs, right? Going from a 7% discount to a 10% a discount, um, gives you just a crazy difference in, uh, valuation. But, you know, another thing we could think of, we could say, you know, COGS is actually, they're going to be brutal. They're going to just get rid of stock-based comp. That's going to go to 20%. SGNA, they're going to come out next year and get this down to like 40%. And they're just going to be this lean, lean machine, get it to 20%. Um, you know, and, you know, in this scenario, right, like SGNA is still growing every year, even though you have it cutting significantly once you kind of back out the um, stock comp from the prior years, then it actually grows pretty significantly here. So you could even say like minus, let's do a two and a half percent, get that down to like 13, something like that. Um, R and D, I mean, yeah, R and D kind of grows pretty bonkers here. If we back out the stock comp, right, maybe this goes down to, maybe we subtract 3% a year. Um, because we want to keep it around, you know, 200 million or so. Let's make this 4%. Let's make this 3%. 3.5% might be better. Yeah. Something like that, right? Um, you know, we're at 31 billion now. So, I mean, you can see if you, you know, hold some of these variables constant, keep your R&D closer to the 200 million X stock comp. But obviously, I mean, I think if you're growing that big, your, your R&D might actually start growing, but SGNA, you know, I think there actually is room for improvement there. Same with COGS, I think if, especially as the more customers you get on, the more profitable you're gonna be because it's, your software is developed, right? It's not, there's not really like that component. It's like a, a launch of the product. Um, so, I mean, you could do something like that, right? Assuming they're gonna get to 600 customers. The other thing you could assume is we could go back here and probably, oops, say, similar to our old assumptions, right? This gets us to 100. And... Actually here, do that. Gets us to 175, but then we could say like, maybe they're gonna do a great job of just, right? So I think there's two sto There's two different ways you can look at this here, right? You can either, gr you could grow the customer base or you can just grow the revenue per customer and just really focus on your current client base. Um, and in this scenario, right, you get, you know, obviously this is still a lot less. Um, you'd probably have to actually grow this even more, but, you know, if you can get your, in right now their top 20 customers, right, it's 33 million customers. So it's not unlikely that in 10 years time, once these people are so deeply ingrained that you could have, you know, 30 million a customer kind of revenue base. And if we look at something like that, right, you're back up to the, the 40 billion. So I think the big thing here with Palantir if you can really get comfortable around their customer acquisition strategy and think they can get most fortune 500 companies on their platform um, without really growing their revenue base much uh, per customer, like, sure, good, this could be a good play. Um, or if you can really get around, you know, customers aren't really going to be the driver here. It's going to be just increasing the revenue of those current clients um, and just become basically so important to these these companies that they can't operate without us, that we can basically just be price and elastic and charge whatever we want. Um, you know, I think that this could be a, a relatively fair, fair value company, but I, I think a lot of things have to go right. Um, just kind of looking at the numbers, but um, yeah, I saw a couple of people ask about updating the model and saw the new 10 K. So read through it. So um, yeah, that's all I have to say today. Hope you found it interesting. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below. Thanks for tuning in.